I've been thinking this week about how you understand or how, what you think of the Beatitudes. Because if you find these things a little bit confusing, I happen to think you're in very good company. Some of them make intuitive sense. You know, you look at this, um, oh, uh, blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers. You know, those kind of things, they, they make intuitive sense. We feel like Jesus is on to something. But then you get to some of these others. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted. That didn't seem to go very well. And, and it does not help, I can assure you, necessarily, if you dig into like, some commentaries. I was looking at two in particular this week that were talking about the word blessed, which often is, so people think of it as happy. And they suggested that it's actually a little more than that. They thought it was best translated as like a phrase. You are very fortunate. Much like, for example, you might say to somebody, you are very fortunate that you bought your house when interest rates were low. Or you are very fortunate that, you know, um, you did not lose your job when the company was doing its reorganization. They think that's a better way of translating this. And so that means Jesus is saying to us, hey, it's really fortunate for you that you're poor. Or it's really fortunate for you that you're mourning something or are being persecuted. And that seems odd. But if you'll allow me, just let's take a look at blessed are those who mourn. I think the issue here, at least for, for me, what, what sort of clears it up is the second half of it. For they will be comforted. I think the only way this makes any sense at all to me, mourning is bad, we all know that, but comforting is good, and I think the only reason the beatitude makes sense is that the comfort has to be so wonderful, so much better than the mourning, that we'll have this moment, this experience of God's comfort, and we will be so, it'll be such a great moment that it'll sort of, if you will, make up for or offset that time of mourning. And then we are fortunate because if we have never mourned anything, there's nothing to be comforted for and we'll, we'll never experience this great moment. I know that sounds a little odd, but I think it also sounds odd because there are two extra things here. It will help if you remind yourself that you can mourn more things than someone dying. We, we mourn lots of stuff. You know, a, a, a teenager is in a relationship and they break up. You know, that, they, they mourn that. They mourn the loss of that relationship. That would be true of any relationship. You know, sadly, sometimes divorce or just family relationships. Something happens. Whether it's our fault or somebody else's, doesn't matter if it, we lose the relationship, it's broken, and we, we mourn that. I mean, heck, a, a, you know, a student can mourn doing poorly on a test. You know, they, they tried their best, and it just didn't turn out very well, and you can mourn that. You can mourn a traffic accident, you know, a hurricane, and all sorts of things that you can mourn. And the second thing I think to keep in mind here is that this is not promising comfort right away. It could be that God is with you in that moment. I'm sure He is and walking alongside of you through a rough moment that maybe the comfort that Jesus is talking about here, maybe, maybe that does happen right away. You feel God's comfort in a, in a, in a tragic moment. That, that happened to me when my mother died. I felt God's comfort pretty much right away. But I know that's not always true. And indeed, there are some parts of this that I think the comfort is, comes much, 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 much later. Maybe in the first reading when John talks about this great moment in heaven. Maybe that's where we're finally 
get to understand, get to feel God's comfort. But I think the reason this is so hard for us is that most of us, we don't wait for God's comfort. We want to comfort ourselves. So we have something happens and we mourn that. We're, we're, we are in, you know, we're grieving whatever it is that happened and we don't want to wait for God's comfort and so we take it upon ourselves to comfort ourselves. You know, so a broken relationship, we try to comfort ourselves by telling the story, spinning it so it's very clear to everybody that it's their fault. And, and by doing that, I, I, I get a little comfort out of that. Well, it wasn't me, it was them, that, you know. Some people that sadly most of us would know, you know, they, they try to find comfort in alcohol or drugs or some other addictive behavior or even indeed um, they nurse their pain, you know, through perhaps otherwise wonderful things, but they just take it to too much of an extreme. They're unwilling to wait for God. So let me offer you a piece of advice, which I know right now very few of you are going to take. Wednesday morning, some of us are going to mourn the results of the election. And that's a real hurt. That will be a real hurt because for whatever reason, no matter what side of this you're on, for whatever reason, you're going to think that, you know, the country has now turned and is going in the wrong direction. And you will hurt and you will grieve that. So the question is, are you going to wait for God's comfort? Are you, going to, are you going to hold on to this verse? You know, blessed are those who mourn. That's me right now. I'm mourning this election, you say. But they'll be comforted. Are you going to wait for God's comfort or are you going to take care of it yourself? Because you can or you can try. Because what you'll do is you'll turn the TV on to your news station the one who's got commentators on it who are also mourning the election. And they will tell you something. And you will go on to social media and you'll read stuff. And if you think about it right now, not knowing anything about how the election will turn out, you know what you're going to hear. You're going to hear stories about some voting irregularity in some tiny town in the middle of Kansas or something. And, and they're going to spin that to whatever it is they want to spin that to. And they're going to make it sound to you like, oh, something was terribly wrong, and it was, all, it was all rigged, and it was all this, and it was that person's fault, and all this stuff. And I just want you to ask yourself right now, is that really going to comfort you? Because I think we all know the answer to that is going to be no. It will not. At, wor at best, I think it's going to just make us mad. But what if you did this, and this is my advice? What if you, on Wednesday morning, you turn on the TV, you find the results of the election, and then you turn it off? And you don't go on the computer, and you don't go on the social media to read lots of articles and people saying all sorts of stuff. You just leave that off, too. And what if, instead of that, you go to God in prayer and you say to God, I hurt. I hurt. I was so sure that this is the right way for the country. I'm so sure of this. Like, why did this turn out this way? God, I don't understand how it is you're working in, in history. And I hurt. Give me comfort. Offer a prayer of trust. And God, even though I don't understand this and I don't like this, I will still trust in you. And maybe you need to say that prayer often and keep the TV off for a while. Because it comes down to a simple choice. You can, if you want, try to be comforted by yourself by something you do or by listening to other people. Or you can be comforted by God. 
You and I all already know which is the better of those two choices. It's just a question of choosing. And so on Wednesday morning, for those of, for those of us perhaps that the election doesn't go our way, or for any situation in your life when you grieve something, I just hope that you will choose to let God comfort you. 